recently read a book. It was called Another Gospel. And it was about, uh, the main point of it was about progress, what's called progressive Christianity. And uh, also talking about her kind of line was, you know, if there's Jesus plus something or Jesus minus something, you're in trouble. The things to watch for. I, I prefer my own kind of topic, which is, you know, there's a ditch on both sides. In other words, that Jesus said, the way of life is a narrow road. The way to destruction is wide. But on that way of life and on that highway of life, there is a, Dutch, a ditch on both sides. On one side, you have uh, kind of a hyper grace, a progressive type Christianity. On the other side, you have legalism. So I'm going to hit the progressive part first. Some of you may have not have heard about it and not even be familiar with it. Um, I know there are some in here who are familiar with it because they have loved ones or family members who have been caught up into that. And about 10 or 15 years ago, I first came across it, and at that time it was called something different. It was actually called the Emergent Church. And basically what it is, it, um, it's kind of the oldest lie in the Bible, where Satan came to Adam and Eve and said, did God really say? And they're used things like, uh, and it's more of a, a humanistic viewpoint because they will, they will say things like, okay, if, if Jesus sent his only begotten son on the cross to suffer and die, wouldn't we consider that child abuse? Or was he really born of a virgin, or is it just a story? Uh, would a loving God send people to hell? That doesn't seem to correlate. Uh, about homosexuality or transgenderism, they said, well, you know, God just made them that way. It's not something they're just struggling with. It, you know, God made them that way. And so basically what it, what it comes down to is, is they begin to say there's really no absolute truths. The only truth is your truth, what you believe. And if you're, it's your truth, then it's your truth. So this has been going on for, like say, what a, uh, quite a while, and it, and it kind of covers also or connects with a, a, another segment uh, of Christianity, kind of the hyper-grace movement. And so I want to look at some scripture because as I look at these two, two ditches, nothing is really new. These things have been dealt with back in the first century with the church that we're dealing with now. Sometimes just the names change, but it's still the same thing. And so I want to start in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter actually, chapter 3. And you need to kind of look at these verses. I'm going to go through a lot of scriptures today. And so some of them I'll just be giving you the, uh, the address for them. And some of them we're going to actually read through. But in 2 Peter, chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 14. And this is Peter. He says, So then, dear brothers, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Now he writes the same in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scripture to their own destruction. So a couple of interesting things about that. First, he says that, that people are mis... Well, for one thing, we can see that Paul's letters is already being circulated through the churches. Now, this is towards Peter's, towards the end of his life. But his letters are being circulated, and he's saying, and he, he compares it to Scripture, he says, as they do other Scriptures. Okay, so what is the distortion? 
What are they saying? What, what are they misrepresenting what Paul is saying? So if we go to, uh, well, before we go, I'm going to go to Romans, but just also in 1 Peter 2, I want to read one quick verse. 1 Peter 2, 16. He says, live as free men, but not, do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God and honor the king. Okay, let's go to Romans. I'm going to spend some time in Romans, chapter, start in chapter 3. Because we want to see again, what is the misrepresentation that he's talking about? And a lot, ha it has to do with grace. In fact, I think, you know, if, if you really understand grace, what's been done for you, I don't see how you could try to turn this into something which gives you, basically, we would say, a license to sin. Because when you understand that you were helpless, you were, there's no way you could save yourself. It was the Lord's grace and His mercy that He has given us eternal life, that He has forgiven us of our sins. And so it's out of gratitude for what's been done to us that we are aligning our lives with His will and His purposes. But in chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 5 through 8. Because he's making a point, he's saying, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust to bring his wrath on us. And I am using a human argument, certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? And here's the key, said, verse 8. Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil, that good may result. Their condemnation is deserved. So people were taking what Paul was saying about grace, how our sins are forgiven, past, present, future. And they were using that to turn and giving them an excuse to live in sin. And they say, how can you say that? How can you say, let us do evil, that good may result. Their condemnation is deserved. Now look over in chapter 5 of Romans. We're going to look at verses 18 through 21. And he again, he talks about, and he's been talking about, about grace and what's been done for us. And he says, consequently, just as a result of one trespass was combination for all men, obviously talking about Adam, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, they may, the many will be made righteous. And he says the law was added so that trespasses might increase. But where sin increased, all the more so that grace increased. So just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So because of what he say that, just said there, he's going to anticipate what they're going to, their question, what their, their question is going to be in chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin 
How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and to death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we certainly also will be united with him in the resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, we cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over us. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives in God. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought, bought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. So again, verse 15 he anticipates the question in their mind. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one who you obey? Whether you are a slave to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that through that that though you used to be slaves of sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human tongues because you are weak in your natural self. Just as you used to offer parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them as slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slave to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What did you reap at the things that, from the things you are now ashamed of, the things that resulted in death? But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is righteousness. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's go on to chapter 7. He goes on and says, Do you know... Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what's once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit 
and not in the way, the old way of the written code. And of course, chapter 8, probably one of the glorious verses, I think. It says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. So we have been set free. Again, that's that grace. So grace is wonderful. Grace is, is, you know, it's the best thing. It's, it's, it gives us life. It gives us eternal life. It gives us, it, it gives us a hope that we didn't have because we were lost. If we got what we deserve, each one of us deserved hell. But it was a grace of God that was shed. His blood, we sing about the blood this morning. That's another thing the progressive church doesn't like to talk a lot about is about the blood. But the blood is so critical, so critical. And there's some other verses, that I'm not going to go there right now, but there's some interesting thing that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, he, he quote, there's quotation marks around it. It says, he says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. And then in... in uh, Chapter 10, he says, all things are lawful, but not everything is constructive or beneficial. So there are things that are beneficial to us, and there are things that, yes, may not be lawful, but they're not beneficial to us. But the whole point is that with a progressive church, and it's a big movement, like say, it started back probably 15 years ago. It was called the Emergent Church again at that time. So the only thing that's really changed is the name uh, I guess maybe that sounds a little better. I don't know. Uh, people like Rob Bell was one of the leaders of it at the time. But what it does, it waters down the gospel. Uh, it tickles the ear because it sounds good. But it, it takes us away from the truth of the Word of God. And so those are, certain, you know, those are things you have to be kind of aware of that's out there. It's not that uh, some of you probably never even heard of it. It's not a, a big deal with you, but others of you I know have. And uh, it's an issue that you're having to deal with with family members. So we want to be clued in because it, it, sounds, it sounds good. It sounds, uh, like I say, it's very humanistic. It's, a, you know, loving but taking the offense of the gospel out of it. So anything that would be offensive to our culture now, they would remove that. And because they don't want to offend people, so they back off from the truth of the gospel. So that's that ditch on one side. Is, is a, it, it, there's two things. It's progressive Christianity, and it's also this hyper grace. This, well, you know, I've been forgiven, my sins are forgiven, past, present, future. I'll just live however I want to live. I think you have misunderstood what grace and what's been done to you. And I would almost think that person probably needs to question their salvation. Because that, that is serious. Because something's not connecting there. So we have that ditch on that side. Okay, the other ditch on the other side is, is legalism. And so, again, we're, we deal with that today, just as, as Paul did, did with that clear back in the first century. So I want to go this time to Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to look through several different passages in Galatians. So Galatians chapter 2, and then we're going to go... Actually, several different passages in Galatians, but we're going to start with verse 11. So this is Peter. Paul's Paul's writing to the Galatian church, and the Galatian church wasn't a a single church. It was to the whole province, so there's a lot of different churches within Galatia. And so he's writing this because it's concerned for the church. And he's going to be talking about when Peter... 
came to Antioch. So this is something that happened in the past. In verse 11, it says, When Peter came to Antioch, it says, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision party. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So here you have two of the prime, you know, Peter, one of the apostles, Barnabas, very famous, one also traveled with Paul. And then Paul says, verse 14, Now when I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, Now you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. In other words, he wasn't being Torah observant. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Now we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawmaker, lawbreaker. For, the, for through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for Christ. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives within me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if the righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So he first tells them the story about Antioch, and Antioch was a place where, uh, Christ, where they first named believers Christians, and it was kind of the mothership of a lot of these other throughout Turkey, present-day uh, Turkey. And he said how some Jews had come, from Jerusalem, and that Peter, before that time, had been living as a Gentile, had not been following uh, Torah, and then all of a sudden when these guys came, he changed and he began to, along with them, and what the Judaizers did was say, it's great that you have become Christians now, but now you need to follow the Torah, you need to follow the Old Covenant. And then Paul very strongly comes against him. And he says, you are Jew. You live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish custom? So now he brings it in chapter 3. So he tells them this story. This is what's happened before. And obviously there's a problem going on in the church of Galatia. Because we're going on with chapter 3. And he uses some pretty strong language. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish at the beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it is really for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law, or because you believe what you heard? Consider Abraham. 
He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All the nations will be blessed through you, so those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith you might receive the promise of the Spirit. Brothers, let us take an example from everyday life. Just as no one set aside or added to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promise was spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if inheritance depends on the law, then it is no longer depends on promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred has come. The law was put in effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come through the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law. We were locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come. We are no longer under the supervision of the law. So you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have closed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and the heirs according to the promise. So I know that's a long passage, but I want you to see it. Because I don't think there's any way you can uh, change those words to mean something different, to twist it. And so I want to go on to chapter 4 through 21. or start Actually, at 4, start at verse 21. Read it on your own time. Read the first part of all uh, chapter 4 up to 21. I'm going to pick it up at 21. 
He, he says, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware that the law says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one of a slave woman and the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of the promise. Now these things may be taken figuratively, for the woman represents two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai, meaning the Mosaic covenant, and bears children who are to be slaves. Now this is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children, break forth and cry aloud. You have you have had no labor pains because more are the children of the desolate woman than of, of her who had a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. All, all that time the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the sin born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Let's go on to chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. Let me stop right there for a second, because I know I've heard people say that, well, we're just talking about circumcision. But no, because when you go to the, the council at Jerusalem, where this all comes to a head in Acts chapter 15, this question of following, having to follow the Torah, the apostles say that neither us nor our fathers could obey it. Now, they were circumcised when they were eight days old. So for them, from their mind point, circumcision is, is no big deal because it's like I was born that way. So it's more involved than just circumcision. Circumcision was the outward sign. So mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You are trying to be justified by a law. Having been alienated from Christ, you have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for what we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressed through love. Now you were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from observing the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Now I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you to confusion will pay the penalty, what, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for these agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, are called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge a sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Now, another whole book I, I would ask that you guys to look through would be the book of Hebrews. Because all through the book of Hebrews, especially from chapter 1 through chapter 10, it's dealing with this same issue, and, he's, and it's coming from a standpoint, we don't know for sure who read or who wrote uh, the book of Hebrews. Many believe it was Apollos because of the, the high Greek that is used in it. But the point is that it begins to sh show throughout the whole 10 verses, the, or 10 chapters, the superiority of Christ in comparison to the Old Covenant. I will read you one verse out of it, and it's uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. It says, By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Let me say that again. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. And one last scripture, again, I would, I would encourage you guys to read all through Romans, through Hebrews, through the different lessons, through, uh, here's one in, in uh, Colossians. I'm going to read uh, 13 through 17, chapter 2. It says, when you were dead in your sins and in your circumcision, your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of him triumph over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, a celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are all shadows of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So again, all these, the festivals, the keep of the Sabbath, all these things were shadows of things that were to come, and the reality was to be found in Christ Jesus. You know, I think I've told you the story before, but when I was in Jerusalem, uh, I was in there actually on the, the Sabbath day, and I was on, like on the 14th floor of the hotel, and we were having a meeting down the lobby, so, you know, I go out and punch the thing, get on the, on the elevator, and the elevator starts going down, and every floor he would stop, and the door would open, and there was no one there. And I only pushed one button, I pushed the lobby, and it stopped the next floor, open, nobody there, continue on this way down. Finally, a guy got on, and he, I, I don't know if he was Catholic or not, but he had a collar on. And, um, and, and I was kind of like, what's up with this? I'm st stopping at every floor, no one's there, nobody. He said, well, this is the Shabbat elevator. So on the Sabbath, you cannot pass that button because that button is work. I thought, really? I said, oh, yeah, yeah. So that, that's where legalism can lead. Uh, now, that there are things that can be a touch point. Oops. So this is my prayer shawl. It was actually, it was made in Jerusalem. It's the real deal. It's not one of those little short things. This is one of the six-foot models with the colors representing different things, the purple, royalty, whatever, the Hebrew writing on it, tassels, 613 tassels which correspond to 613 laws that are in the Old Covenant. Okay? But let me ask you, and I use this sometime to pray. You think the Lord hears my prayers anymore when I wear this than when I don't? You think he's any more pleased with me when I wear this? I use it as a, 
again, as a, what I call kind of a touch point of where we've been. I also use it as there are 1,613 laws that I could have never have kept if not for the grace of God. Sometimes we, you know, I, I've often thought, where did this movement, what we call now the Hebrew Roots Movement, I became aware of it back in the 90s, towards the, uh, probably towards the end of 90s, and it actually just started in the early 90s. And I think from the evangelical church, we have always been one, you know, who supported Israel, who support the Jewish people, and believe that there's coming a day when there's going to be a mass ingathering of Jews. And somewhere along that line of that support, I think things begin to get twisted. And in that support, we begin to, to go back. And maybe it's, it's to, to have a, a touch with Jewish people, but I find that almost everybody involved in it is not Jewish. While in Paul's day, it was the Jewish people because they, they came from that background. That's all they knew was the Old Covenant. And so for them, it would be a natural thing to say, okay, this is what God wants, then this is my background. You guys ought to be doing that too. And so I think what is, is worrisome is, okay, where, where's the point where you pass from observing a past and for me, myself, you know, it's like I drive a car and I drive a truck. Well, the root of that is a horse and buggy. I don't want to particularly go back to a horse and buggy. The new covenant is so much glorious. Now, I can see looking back and say, okay, this is where we came. This is what this meant. These are what these festivals meant. But all these things pointed to Jesus. They're all fulfilled in Jesus. So I think the thing we have to watch and be careful of, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, Yeshua, okay? Uh, that's Jesus' name in, in Hebrew. Now, if I was speaking to a Jewish audience, I'd probably use that. But is there more power in the name of Yeshua than there is in Jesus or whatever Japanese or Chinese or whatever else is? Or is it, do we use that because we're in the know? We know the history. You know, throughout the years, I've gone through the Old Testament in chronological order over 40, 40 times, 40 some times. And while I appreciate it and I get things from it, there's no way that I, I want to go back to the Old Covenant. I want to understand, I want to appreciate where we came from. And I do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I do pray for, for the ingathering of the Israelites to come back to faith. But I think we just have to be very careful that we don't step across the line where it goes from... from uh, from observing something to legalism. And one way you can probably tell that, let's say if you're keeping the dietary laws, somebody bring, your buddy brings you a, a cheeseburger, or at least you think it's a cheeseburger, and you begin eating that cheeseburger, and then you find out halfway through it was a bacon cheeseburger. If you begin to feel guilt then I think that should be a, a red flag to you. Or if you begin to observe, you know, you're the Sabbath and you, you did something, you drove somewhere or you went farther than a Sabbath day journey and you begin to feel, oh no, I failed. Then I think you got to realize you may have gone from, from honoring some traditions to, to coming into a place of, of legalism. And so we have this this road of life, and then we have, on one hand, we have this, which I'd call, people use uh, license to sin. You know, they, they use progressive Christianity to kind of, let's tone down things, let's not talk about some things that are unpopular. 
The other side is a, a legalism that we can get on. And what I've also observed over these years, because I became acquainted with all this back in the early 90s, uh, is that I've seen people, whichever side, whichever ditch they got in, you know, if you read accident reports, you know how often you see this happen where someone says they got off the side of the road and what happened? They overcorrect. They go clear to the other side and line up in a ditch. And I've seen that happen both ways. I've seen somebody who's been really into it, uh, to the Hebrew roots moment, very, I mean, their, their world got very small because there were so many things they couldn't do. Well, eventually, they ended up going completely the opposite way. They, instead of just correcting, they went clear into complete sin and just throwing away everything. So there's a danger, again, on both sides. And so that's why we have to stay on the road of life. We have to stay in that place of letting the word of God. Because there's no way you can really take those scriptures and try to twist them to say something else. They say what they say. We are under a new covenant. And while I appreciate the old covenant, while I appreciate things I've learned, my hope is in the new covenant, in the grace of God. And I think that's just something we need to be careful of, that we don't step across a line where you begin to, if you begin again to feel, feel guilty, or I failed God, or I'm, I, you know, I thought I, you know, trying to merit something, you're never going to merit righteousness. All our righteousness is those filthy rags. It's only through the grace and the blood of Jesus. So, Lord, we just, we just thank you. Lord, for your grace, Lord, that you have given us grace. Lord, you have taken us from darkness into the kingdom of light. We thank you, Lord, that it's just your mercy. Lord, we were helpless. We were helpless, Lord, until that blood, as we sang earlier about, was applied. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for those things that, that seem to be uh, hard for some people to accept. That it's by the cross, death of the Son of God, that we have been given life. Lord, we thank you. You are so worthy, Lord. So, so worthy of all our praise and all our adoration. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep us on the path of life. Lord, if we begin to fall into either ditch, Lord, keep us on a short chain. Yank us, pull us back. Lord, that we would stay in the center of your will. And Lord, I just thank you. I praise you for your goodness, your kindness, and all that you've done for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name. You know, in all this study, I've been uh, doing quite a bit of reading, researching on uh, the Essenes. And I may have mentioned this before, that, you know, they were the Pharisees, they were the Sadducees, they were the Essenes. The Essenes were the one who wrote and copied the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And they not only had the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they also had a lot of, of prophetic books that we have been in the last, probably especially 20 years, they have been uh, translated, and some of them are just portions, but it's very interesting because the calendar uh, the Jewish people use now are, is actually the Pharisaical calendar. And the scenes said that was a wrong calendar, that the calendar had to be a solar calendar as it was from the beginning. But they also had prophecies that they believed in the first, a first and a second coming of Messiah. Why the Jews never saw that. They had a prophecy that the age of Torah would end in the AD 75, which is pretty close. Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. 
and that the, the Savior would again come and establish the kingdom of God. And I also learned some things about, you know, because sometimes we think, you know, our Gregorian calendar, people will say, you know, some of that comes from our months, from um, Jupiter, from uh, actually gods. But do you know that the Hebrew calendar, where it came from? It came from Babylon in the 6th century, in 6th century B.C., the same names they use. So we've got to be very careful when we, you know, accuse on one side, you know, about the Greg Gordon calendar and how things have been perverted and Greek thinking and Hebrew thinking. And, and there's just a lot of things that the more I get in, the more I see. And the more I study, I find a lot of things that, that are not always said as what some people have said. So I just would encourage you guys to read through those passages, read through the book of Hebrews. Uh, there's so much in there. So much in there. While we, again, and we appreciate our past, we appreciate where we've come from, but appreciate the new covenant that has been given for us. We are such a blessed people. Such a blessed people. So, Lord, we just thank you again for this morning. We just thank you for your word. We thank you again for your grace. And, Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.